Round of applause, please. Welcome. Cool. Hi, everybody. My name is Ryan. I'm a data scientist at Omada Health. And today, we're going to be talking about this. Yes, using data science to design effective, precision, preventative behavioral medicine. A lot of adjectives, but we'll unpack it throughout the rest of the presentation, hopefully. Uh, just some context. So today, I think I, what I want to do is really just share stories about some successes and failures as we built a product from which had no data science team to having a, sort of a personalized product and kind of the steps that it took to get there. Because ultimately, I think that's kind of why we're all here, to collaborate, share some stories about what works and what doesn't for health behavior change. Because yeah, we want to make a population that are all hyper well beings, right? Cool. So, but first, before we kind of dive into that, let me give you a little bit more context about what Omada Health does. So this is our mission at Omada Health. We inspire and enable people everywhere to live free of chronic disease. The problem that we're focusing on is right now is diabetes. As you might know, there's 27 million people with type 2 diabetes in the United States right now. But what most don't know is that there are much more at risk with prediabetes. And that's growing at a rate of 5 to 10% each year. Uh, there's also just been you know, some more kind of data to support that fact. It's been quadrupling just the burden of diabetes in our population since 1980. The solution has actually uh, been demonstrated. Uh, lifestyle change interventions are, have been shown to be effective. Uh, landmark diabetes prevention study, if I acronym it out, it's just DPP throughout the rest of the uh, presentation. But that showed a 58% reduction uh, compared to the placebo in reducing risk for diabetes. And even better so than using metformin. And yeah, there's just a large body of evidence right now for the clin clinical evidence for the efficacy of a DPP in reducing risk for diabetes. So we have the problem, we have the solution, but really, what's the deal, right? Why, hasn't, why is this still a problem? And in short, behavior change, we think, is hard. It's, it's hard to scale. A lot of these are in-person DPP programs, so it's hard to, those 27 million, those 80, like 100 million people with prediabetes, how do we scale out an in-person program? And it's a combination of factors, right? Behavior changes, a little bit of education, device trackers, calorie counting, health coaching, social support, all these factors kind of need to coalesce in order to have an effective lifestyle change intervention. And some studies have shown, too, that's like, why can't we just like hand someone a device? Why can't we just hand someone an app and call it a day? But one dimension really isn't enough for an effective health behavior change. And there's some data to back that up as well. So you kind of like, our marketing team loves this. We've had, uh, you kind of need the full symphony. I'm a music guy, too. I kind of like this analogy. But you really need the full symphony of behavior change, all those components working together for each individual to work. So that's kind of what the Amata program is. It is the sort of uh, synthesis integration of a lot of different behavioral change components, education, uh, tracking devices, and such to kind of deliver an effective health behavior intervention. So we kind of, kind of see here, uh, we have a participant peer group, social support, like a social network that allows them to connect and also connect with their full-time health coach. Also, we have interactive lessons kind of certified by the CDC that they take in order to understand things like diet, exercise, uh, stress management. We also have kind of easy to use technology. I think the biggest, the coolest thing about our program is the scale that we send. Uh, right out of the box when you're, you are into the program, we have a scale that's th connected to our like 3G cellular network, so when you step on the scale, you see that uh, weight data point right on your app. So yeah, our program is broken into several phases. First phase is about eating healthier. Second phase, increasing activity, and so forth. I, I, won't, go, I won't spend too much time on this part as I want to get to some of the stories and successes. So, uh, yeah, and some we have six, I think, believe six, current uh, peer-reviewed publications right now. 
Um, all, some, one of them is focusing on how effective OMADA is compared to in-person DP pr programs, and in, I think we've demonstrated that it's at least as effective, if not more. So again, you sort of need the whole full symphony for an effective health behavior change. And one question is, where does data science fit into that whole kind of analogy? And we would like to think it's sort of the conductor. It's orchestrating all this for an individual because we believe that uh, for an effective health behavior change program to work, it's really about understanding the individual context. And for everybody, you know, they might not like the same music. So what is data science at Omada? It's using analytics, machine learning, and experimentation to parameterize what works and what doesn't for health behavior change. And really, we like to think of it as designing and deploying the right intervention at the right time for the right person. And maybe this can be called pre preventative pre precision preventative medicine. And so this is like, you know, a visualization of just some, a subset of the data that we're collecting right now. This is one person out of 100,000. And the types of things we're collecting are like private messaging between their health coach and uh, the participant themselves. Um, things like how they're interacting with the lessons, how they're progressing through uh, knowledge of the program and knowledge of their diet and so forth as well. So completion times, reading proficiency, stuff like that. Uh, we also have physical activity tracking that you can connect to uh, your wearable, wearable devices or you can use a pedometer straight out of your phone. Also just, yeah, more group messaging and social support from just, uh, you can think of it like a Facebook for your community, for your uh, health behavior change community. And then also meal tracking is a very important thing as well. I think you get the idea. And of course, weighing in and your progress there. Some more data, we call this the, like, I don't know, Hadouken or like flamethrower graph, but ultimately it's why x-axis is the amount of time that someone has spent in the program, y-axis is weight loss, and just kind of, I think, the general idea is that a large mass of it is people are losing weight. Uh, this is also a weigh-in map of people around uh, the United States that are weighing in. Uh, we just hit 10 million weigh-ins about a month ago. So yeah, we're growing fast around the country. So now kind of to share some stories. Uh, I think what I want to sh uh, share a little bit of is how we went from ground zero to the place we're at today where we're thinking a lot more about personalization, prevention. I think uh, the previous speaker mentioned uh, the four Ps. Uh, we also kind of like really embrace that as well. So how do we get from nothing to something? So imagine this. You're kind of like the first and only data scientist at your company. You have obviously have a lot of data with a ton of potential, but uh, your company really has no sort of support for data science or that, uh, sort of that team or has any familiarity with data-driven product development. What do you do? Uh, one option is to kind of play we call like data police where you show up in meetings you know, with your graphs and say, like, no, 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 this is not the way we should be going. This is the way we should be going. Uh, we found that that's just not really an effective form of communication. What really helps oftentimes is really kind of getting your company, getting your team to embrace a data science culture. And what we kind of, how we kind of thought about that is how, what are ways that we can like, I think a lot of the previous speakers did a great job of showing visualizations that get people excited, get people thinking about how can we can really leverage data to make an effective health behavior change or just health product overall. Uh, there's a lot of ways to do this that we thought. Uh, one I want to kind of give an example of is just really just something simple, starting a data blog. Uh, we call this plot of the week, but really it's, it's like just an internal weekly email data blog that we're kind of we're pumping out plots all the times on our team, and how can we kind of create stories that really get people excited, uh, who never really thought about like you know the utility of data, how it can be used, and just mobilize support for data in a health product. Uh, so one of the ones I want to get into is called All in the Family. Uh, hopefully, this will get you excited too about kind of just the the merits of our raw data as well. 
Uh, so let's dive, dive into that. So what happens oftentimes is like these scales become such a central part of the household that many people jump onto the scale. You put it in your bathroom, your mom, your dad, your dog starts stepping onto the scale. And we kind of see that in the data too. So I'm gonna go through a few of these. We call these reading the tea leaves sometimes because obviously we can't generalize these trends to a larger uh, population, but it does help us think about like what is happening with these scales. So here's a, what we call a family of two losing weight together. So what, again, x-axis is program time, how much time they're in the program. Y-axis is uh, weights in pounds. So generally, if you see something going sloping down, that's a good thing. Uh, but yeah, we find this actually to be the case, though. It helped us generate some hypotheses that, oh, people with spouses actually tend to lose more weight in our program. And maybe that's not so surprising in terms of like the social support, but it's good to get that validation, too, in our population. Uh, here's another family of two. We see this a lot, where there's just giant chunks of uh, missing data at times. So maybe uh, they were on vacation, who knows? Here's another one, family of three. Uh, you can see maybe the little guy down there is a growing child uh, in the program. So uh, here's another one where we, like sometimes we often see these like giant strips of data that write down at one point in time. We like to think that it's like they had a neighborhood party and everyone started coming over into the you know, bathroom or something. It's like, oh, cool, a scale, jump. And then now you see this like <laughs> giant spike. Uh, here's another one that I, we still like have no idea sometimes. Sometimes we get all these like really crazy graphs and we're just trying to create stories around them and we're still like, hmm, we have no clue. Like this one has like some seasonality to it and suddenly like, you know, there's two maybe groups. One, uh, Eric, our VP, suggested that this might be a Sunday school of some sort where there's some adults and some children that all meet together at a certain week of the, of, in the week, and that's what creates this like, kind of segmentation. But question marks still to this day. Cool. Anyway, so that's some of the ways that hopefully you, know, you kind of have an understanding of what you know, some fun parts of our product. You're now more invested in, like, in data itself, and now you're kind of ready for data-driven product development. Well, this is kind of you know, some of the things that we've learned thus far, building this sort of uh, relationship between data science and product at Omada. Uh, hopefully, you can kind of take some of the lessons that we learned here. So oftentimes, like, you know, when I would say when we're ready for data and product to kind of exist, those apps happen at two ends of like, this, this stage right here. It's like, products on one side of your company, data science, and maybe on another side, you have to walk over. Uh, product will come over and ask, like, hey, what's going on with X, Y, and Z? The data science brings that into their queue, kind of does some analysis, makes some recommendations, insights, and that's kind of, you call it a day. That's kind of the feedback loop. But what we found that is that this in, advi in an advisory role, data science just isn't quite as effective, especially for something like uh, a health behavior change product. Uh, what happens a lot of times is that data science uh, or product is responsible for creating the data models and what data science needs like they don't have and vice versa. It's kind of like what we think of it as like if you ever watch Home Improvement, uh, it's a little bit like Tim the Toolman Taylor coming over to Wilson in the, across this proverbial fence saying like, oh, I have these problems. And Wilson's like, oh, I have some solutions. But sometimes they just don't meet eye to eye. And uh, you end up getting into this world of uh, constant problems and solutions that nothing, nothing ever really gets built. And what we find that embedding data science into the product uh, organizationally was really, really helpful. I think um, the previous speaker also just mentioned about hypothesis generation, these correlations leading to kind of more ways of developing and designing new types of interventions for your, your product and or before health behavior change. And that's kind of, we've really much adopt that, adopted that in an organizationally as well. It's in order to create a, an effective like, uh, feedback loop between data science and product, it really has to exist uh, inside of it as well. So our data science team is now like, a lot more deployed across the product team 
figuring out, like, uh, driving the experiments, creating, uh, being able to deploy production code that actually launches experiments in our app so that we can figure out what works and what doesn't for behavior change. Phew. OK. So that's just some of the, like, what I mentioned in the last two, building a data science culture, uh, kind of creating a nice feedback loop in a data science and product relationship. All these are really investments that we've made to make personalization, prevention, prediction in our product happen. Uh, and these are some of the things. I'd like to share some case studies that we have with you right now, just to kind of talk about like, how we've been thinking about it, uh, precision uh, prevention in our program, how to target the right patient at the right time in the right way. Uh, and a lot of this is like revolved around uh, impactful experimentation. I should mention that our business model is actually outcomes-based pricing. So unless people actually meet their weight loss goals, they actually meet their, uh, yeah, their weight loss goals and actually reduce risk for diabetes, we don't get paid. So our outcome metrics at the end of the day are largely weight loss oriented. So as you know, I might know, like the best way to sort of understand causality is through the randomized controlled trial experiments. Uh, but a large problem in the clinical literature is that low N, it's very labor intensive, it can be slow. Uh, you often get bias in populations, they're not generalizable, uh, they don't have external validity. But at Amato, we really built, we kind of took this uh, and built experimentation directly into the product, just really to take advantage of that measurement power of experimentation, while the digital nature of our program mitigates the sort of cons of that, uh, of running RCTs. Just we have much higher N, it's a lot less expensive, and there's much quicker, quicker iteration. Uh, we currently have around 35 product experiments, and it's growing quickly. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of null results as well, which is nice because, you know, null results are learnings too, but sometimes you can't publish those as easily. But at our product, in our product, we really embrace, like, if that didn't work, why? And one of the things that uh, we've kind of looked into a lot is just personalization through experimentation. What can we find out from our experiments? I think I'll just go through, we have two, but I think there's only, since there's only two minutes left, I'll just focus on one uh, really well, which is just how we've experimented with physical activity engagement. So obviously physical activity is a large part of a healthy lifestyle. Uh, and the second phase of a modest program focused specifically on increasing patients' physical activity. We provide pedometers, but they can also connect their wearable devices to their app. And there's educational components, but ultimately we also, a big part of it is setting daily step goals for participants. As you might know, Fitbit, these kind of devices tend to have like a default step goal of 10,000 steps. Uh, products like Garmin also actually do like this sort of auto step goal where it increments it based off your activity. I think what we really wanted to do was actually understand what were the merits of that? How was that actually going to ultimately improve uh, physical activity engagement throughout the course of the program? So in our, pro in our program, we can kind of play with this number. Patients are challenged with step goals, daily step goals to increase physical activity. Uh, one of the questions we had was, can we provide personalized step goals that will actually increase physical activity behavior in the long term? And some of the ways that we thought about it is like, what did the data tell us? We found that uh, x-axis here is BMI categories. So um, as they have more, more BMI, uh, overall just less steps per day. Uh, this kind of qualitative, our qualitative team sort of uh, confirmed this as well, is that people just weren't really happy with their initial step goal. They, some felt they were just too high, some felt they were too low. So we really wanted to explore this hypothesis. And what we have did found is, is we use the data itself, like stratify through age and BMI, to just kind of say like, hey, you know, everyone starts at a different place. Why don't we just start with this number? Uh, use their historical mean if for each age and BMI category and just bump that up by 20% and see how people uh, interact with that. Uh, what we found is that so we randomized people to 50% receiving pers these personalized step goals and 50% re receiving these static step goals. What we found is that uh, on the 
right side you have males, on the left side you have females, is that uh, maybe younger males actually really, uh, they match, adaptive goals may be more impactful for younger males. So maybe you can apply this you know, in some of the products as well, that this is one way of actually increasing engagement overall. But overall, like, we did not, in our population sort of uh, experiment, we actually didn't really see much of an effect at all. It wasn't until we started exploring the subgroups there. So time is up, but I'm, gonna, so I'm just going to skip through this. Thank you very yeah. much. But overall, thank you for your time. And yeah. I appreciate it. Thank yeah. you.